Cool. Nate, thank you very much for being here. Um, yeah, I couldn't thanks think for of having a, me. Yeah, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I couldn't think of a better way to kind of officially announce a partnership that we're going to have here between Go Guide and the Fly Crate. And uh, I'm really excited to hear your story, kind of dive deep and learn how you were able to take your passion for fly fishing and turn it into a business um, yeah. and what you've learned from it. So really appreciate you being here. Really excited to kind of learn from you and hear your story. Yeah. And thanks for having me. I'm glad you're given, uh, you have this platform that I can talk on and hopefully some people can learn from my failures and minor successes. You know, it's been <laughs> a slow roll. So, you know, eight years of just gradual growth. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I, where I want to start is what is your 45 second elevator pitch of who you are and what you do? Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I love creating things. I love building things. My goal is always to add value to, to people's lives. And, you know, I have multiple different companies, and this is just one of my favorites that I dedicate a lot of time to. Um, you know, really, it's just a passion of creating things, you know, Legos as a kid. Now it's companies and products and product management, delegating, hiring. And, uh, you know, the Fly Crate is really just a spiral off of one of my my hobbies it i started fly fishing when i was 11 and now it's become a, a massive you know endeavor and endeavor i have a, a bunch of contractors employees working on this 24 7 you know really the mission is just to educate people help veterans and get people outside so you know as far as 45 seconds i don't know if i i got it all the way there but essentially that that's me in a nutshell so where did that come from? I, I like trying to understand kind of where this entrepreneurship journey started. Um, mm -hmm. Where did you develop that passion for it? And <clears throat> you said you're working on multiple different things, one of right. which is the fly crate. Um, where did that come from and what has that journey been? Yeah, so, you know, as a kid, I, I didn't grow up like privileged, like I didn't, we didn't have a lot of money and my family was on food stamps for a while. Uh, you know, my dad went through a series, of a series of hardships that, you know, in his own personal life and business life that affected the family. So we were always under the support and care of our community church. So, and those people that were donating and helping us, all of them were either self-employed or CEOs of corporations. So, I was always around people that had money and I was very curious as to why their lives were different than, than my family's. So I sort of went down that rabbit hole in, in high school and just really took a hard look at what the differences were and it, was all, it always came back to the same thing, was always managing a company or you know, building one. So you know, I, I spent a ton of time reading books, learning as much as I could. I did that like book a day thing in high school where I'd read a book and just skim read, take notes, and then try and implement it. But I didn't have anything at 16 years old to really put the time into. So I waited until I was about 18 years old to, to start my first company, which was the Fly Crate. Uh, but it really just spiraled off of hardships at a young age and seeing and learning from other people. And I, you know, I went around and I asked people, I was just like, why, like, I was very blunt, I was just like, why do you have money? Like what, what makes you different? And it always was, Hey, you know, I worked a long time. I run this company or, you know, I started my own business. It was hard for a bit or, you know, some version of that. And then now we're good. And so that's, that's what really drove, you know, my, my pursuit of entrepreneurship, running a company, wanting to do something for my own, you know, and the, of course there's, you know, like the creative outlets and that sort of thing. But it was really just how can I help my family and how can I help myself in the future? That's really interesting. <clears throat> I didn't know that about you. Um, so take me back to that time when you're, you've learned from people you've been around. <clears throat> this is, this is the route that I'm going to take to, to be able to, you know, 
help my family to create something of your own, what's the first mm -hmm. step? Yeah, I mean, first step is is really just having a good idea, having something, having something that you've thought of that uh, necessarily would it would it would add value to your life and other people's life. So, like back in the day, eight years ago, I was I was just coming off of Christmas break in college, freshman year, and I, I was watching videos on my PS3. It was refurbished and it was a garbage unit and this, it, it overheated. And I was just like sitting in my basement wondering, okay, I just watched 13 hours of this show. What am I doing with my life? And I had like a mirror to mirror moment, like looking at myself and I'm just like, oh, what the heck are you doing? You just wasted all this time. You have all these goals. What, you know, you need to do something now. So I sat down and I used this thing called the hedgehog method, which is a Venn diagram of three circles. And essentially it's like, what are you good at? What do you like doing? And what can you make money doing? Like, what can you make a lot of money doing? And uh, I put everything I knew on, in a list and I just evaluate them against that scale. And fly fishing came out uh, as like one of the top options. And, you know, I started fly fishing at 11 through the Boy Scouts and through Trout Unlimited, you know, like events and that sort of thing. And I already knew a lot of people in the industry through Trout Unlimited. So I was just like, this seems like a really good option. And I got to thinking, okay, what would differentiate myself? What would add uniqueness to whatever company I start? Like what would be really something that would make me stand out? And at the time, uh, I didn't know that there were any subscription-based fly fishing companies, so like a subscription box. And you know, after like a, a couple hours of digging, I found I found a couple that were in there. But you know, in terms of online retailers, there's like hundreds, right? But in terms of fly fishing subscription boxes and like memberships, there was only like three. So I became one of those, and that immediately set me apart from everyone else. And that allowed me to have like a different angle and a different pitch. And, you know, while it's not like our biggest like market focus that we spend all our time promoting, uh, it is still one of our key, you know, cornerstone products that, that we launch on the fly crate every quarter. Um, but, you know, if I were to pick one thing, it would just be find something that would set yourself apart and then try and build enough value around it. Like there's, tons of things out there that basically say, you know, uh, what are the common complaints and issues that people have and then find a way to solve them. And if you can solve them all by wrapping it into a product, great, you know, or a service, solve that problem. Now people will gladly pay money to solve that problem in their personal life. Bam, done money. Now you have a business making machine. That's basically it. So, you know, that was like the steps that I took. And I, re I have repeated that multiple times uh, successfully using that same sort of method. But now, now it's a lot more data heavy. And if you're not making decisions based on data, then you're already behind the eight ball. You know, you're already losing because you're making a gut decision and not backing it up with data. So, you know, everything now is just like, what do we think is a good idea? And then is it proven to be a good idea? Did we experiment? Did we split test it? Like I'm sure with go guides, you're like you're immediately setting yourself apart from so many other people and competitors, but you're doing a much better job. You have a better product, better service, and then you know you're that it's unique. It's a great name, by the way. And then bam, right there. That's why it's that's why you are where you are. Yeah, <clears throat> I think there's definitely something to. I, I like your concept of the Venn diagram of the. Find something that you like, find something you're good at, and find something that you can make money with. Um, mm -hmm. What was your – I'm curious. When you, you finished that Venn diagram, what was the part that made you think you could make money in fly fishing? Because I think that is – that's like a very – that's a hard question, right? Like for yeah. – there's a lot of people who are good at fly fishing and like it. And there's a lot of people who are good at hunting and they like it, but a lot of people struggle to figure out how to monetize it. So I'm curious right. where that jump came in for you. 
Yeah. So, I mean, uh, in your ter- are you are you speaking in terms of like uh, profitability? Like, how is the fly crate actually succeeding present day? Like that sort of. thing? I think or- more more just putting yourself back in that position. Like when you were deciding to start it, how did you know you could make money with it? And like, did you have a couple different options of ways you wanted to make money? Obviously you've, you've done a really good job with it. Um, but a lot of people have that where they just don't know how to monetize it. What was your process for figuring out how you were going to monetize it? Even if it was just a gut react, like gut instinct of, I think I can do this. And it was a lot of comparison, like looking at competitors, not in the subscription box space, but more in just like the overall fly fishing industry. I always knew I was going to sell flies. It's just how do I package it? Do I package it in a monthly, Mm -hmm. quarterly box, annual subscription? You know, do I sell credits to then people trade into flies or do I sell it a la carte version where, you know, it's just like a typical online retail store. You walk into Cabela's, Orvis, whatever that sort of thing. So like in comparison, I knew that I knew I could make money. I honestly at the time didn't know how much money I could make. And that's why I kind of lucked out in that sense that in fly fishing, you can make decent money. The margins are pretty high on fly fishing flies. Uh, But the actual like it can't, there's a market cap. Like you can't charge more than like $3 for an Adam's parachute or else people start complaining you know, that's understandable because, you know, you need like 12 of them at a time or whatever. But um, back in the day, I, I, I just looked at uh, how other people were charging and understanding the cost that I had to, to actually buy the flies wholesale and just going, okay, well, if, if this wholesale guy is selling it to me for $13 a dozen, I know I can get it for probably like half that because they do a 50% mark markup probably. Right. So, um, but honestly for the first like three years of the fly crate, I didn't make any money and I was wondering where all the money was going. And it was because I was in college and they teach you the theory of like profit margins and ROI and all that stuff, but they don't really do any real life examples. And no one was like mentoring me to go, Hey, have, do you know your margins? Do you know your ROI? Do you understand what that stuff means? Do you understand how quickly the money's going to get into your profit, like in, into your bottom line? Like, when are you going to get the money back? Because it's on the shelf. Uh, you know, inventory based model systems is a lot different than like service based and, and that sort of thing. But making money on an initial idea, you, you got to do your research. Like, if, if I were to go back, I would have done Mm -hmm. things so much differently. I would have been like five years ahead of where I am right now if I only knew how to manage my money. Dive into that a little bit. Hopefully that answers. What would you Yeah, what would you do differently? Like how'd you turn it around? Yeah, I mean Yeah, so if I were to start from square one, uh I would I would still buy wholesale, but I would try and negotiate harder for for a lower cost because When you're selling flies, there's only like two different ways you can really, you know, differentiate yourself, make your your shop stand out. Everyone sells an Adam's parachute. Everyone sells an Adam's, you know, dry fly. So it's just like, okay, why should they buy yours? There's cost and there's, well, I guess three things, cost, quality, and then like any additional value that you add on top of it. So like if I were to go back, I'd still buy wholesale, get a lower price so that I could charge less, eat a little bit of the cost. Um, and I would start immediately going towards manufacturing it ourselves. So like going over to Cambodia, Sri Lanka or Kenya or wherever, you know, you choose to get a made, that's where everyone gets them made. Really. Um, hardly anyone, like maybe 3% of the fly fishing industry gets their flies manufactured in North America. Everything has to be like foreign imported because the cost is majority like of the it's the labor cost. So I would go there because there's significantly more margins. Um, I would be more consistent on marketing. Uh, for example, social media and email marketing. We just sent our first email out in probably like eight months. <laughs> like the whole thing of e-commerce is you, you, you get loyal customers 
Well, you earn their lo loyalty of their of your shop, and then you continuously remind them that you're in existence, and you want to get in front of as many eyeballs as possible, and you also want to promote yourself on social media, and have like an like an underlying strategy. We haven't done any of that for like five years, so like it was off and on consistency. And if we, I were to go back, I would be consistent and post every week, like, for example, email marketing, three days a week, social media, every other day or every three days, something long, along those lines, and just be present. And, and focus, like, no one wants to see clip art on your social media pages. Do, do a little bit better. Like, you're out fishing, just document what's already happening. So if you're like a fly fishing guide or you own a shop, and you're packaging orders, that's content. Just film everything and then like, just put it out there. And if people don't like it, then just pivot to a different thing that you've already filmed. So like catching fish, uh, tips and tricks. Uh, how do you Euro nymph? Here's how we package our stuff. Here's how we get the boat on and off. Here's someone holding, you know, trout, like stuff like that. And just film everything and, you know, take photos, but filming has always and always will be the the biggest you know engager of, of social media and marketing so yeah <laughs> consistency and really get to know your numbers and just like down to the penny know your percentage and just like dial it in my uh my advice that i have for outfitters when they talk about social media because everyone always a lot of a lot of outfitters kind of complain about like oh, i don't want to have to use social media yeah the way I kind of approach it with my company and what I recommend to people is start with quantity and then improve quality and then right. do both. Like just get something out there and the documentation approach works really well. I also like the concept of being a reporter. Like you want to be able to, in my opinion, your marketing and especially through social media should be about providing value. If you can provide value, you're going to be able to get value back. But if you can provide value for free to start, that's like the best way to market. And it takes time to be able to provide value. You want to be able to position yourself as an expert. So if you're in a position, you're new, like you're starting a guide service from scratch, you're starting an e-commerce site from scratch, and you don't necessarily believe that you are an expert yet, like for me, I don't run a guide service, so I don't, don't want to position myself as an expert on how to grow a guide service. But what I can do is I can create a podcast and I can go talk to guide services and businesses in the outdoors all around the country. And I can be a reporter, learn from them, hopefully deliver those as content on our social media, provide value without me having to position myself as an expert. And then three years from now, I can go back and say, yeah, I've interviewed 300 of the best business minds in the outdoor industry about how to grow and scale your business and talked to over 150 guide services and found the tips and tricks that they use to actually scale their business. Right. And here's what I recommend. That positions me as an expert in order to provide more value. Um, but by being a reporter first, I don't have to lie about like not being an expert. I'm just learning. I'm just researching. I'm talking to people. Right. And that's the way I've went about it. That allows us to provide consistent content um, and hopefully deliver value within our marketing. But it just starts with quantity. And then you yeah. slowly improve the quality, you build your expertise, and then you can position yourself as such. So yeah. as it relates to like a guide service, um, yeah, start with documenting and then do some teaching, like provide some value. Like you're already doing it on the water, just record it. So it's interesting. And you understand it because like, you've been able to take and scale and grow your business in that way. But I'm curious, you said that you weren't doing that for a while. How do you grow your business? Yeah, I mean, so the majority of our traffic actually comes from uh, content marketing. So we write a ton of articles and that's where our, uh, contractor, our contractors come in. We have fly fishing guides across the United States that write all of our content. And, you know, we, we focused heavily on SEO, you know, writing search engine optimization, SEO. Uh, we write a lot of articles tailored to what people are searching, what are, what are people looking for? And then we do our best to create the best articles possible. We get really good photos. We, we just make it 
plain and simple. Here's the answer. We don't add any fluff. This is, this is how you urinymph. This is what a beginner should do, you know, so on and so forth. So we, we get all of our traffic primarily from content marketing and that's like a free channel that you can try. So like for, for us, the, the, when I first started, that was the best thing I ever did was decide where our goal is to acquire the, like beginners and people who want to improve their fly fishing skill. And that has never changed since the beginning. And we've just been tailoring all of our content towards that. And if you look on our social media channel, um, everything is that now. And that's because we've been picking up the slack that, you know, we left social media and email marketing. Um, but it has always been content heavy. So that, that's what saved us. And, you know, the more content you produce, the more views you're you know, it, it correlates the more views you're going to get. And we've just been continuously pumping out content. And I've seen it where we stop producing content. We see a decrease in, you know, visitors. And then I was just like, uh-oh. And then we just wrote more. And you just hire more. And, you know, as long as you pay people good. And I, I have a lot of sweat equity in the fly crate. Like, I wrote a lot of the articles that are present on the website. And now it's, now I've been able to delegate and outsource that as we've grown and I've had more money to dedicate to uh, content marketing. Like we spend probably like close to $2,000 a month just on content. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot of money. That's a lot of flies. Like that, that takes so many flies to afford yeah. $2,000. Like if I make 50 cents on a fly, like I got to sell 4,000 flies. Like that's, it's not, you know, it's not cheap, but so that's how we get visitors now. The thing that I take from that is like we talked about with social media and your email marketing and providing value. You were already doing that. Like you, it was just a different channel by doing it through blogs. What I like about what you said is we just wanted to provide value because we provided value in the form of articles that helped beginners start fly fishing. You were able to capitalize on that. That's right. That's what a lot of people miss in my opinion. Um, you just have to you wanna, provide value. You have to yeah. provide value and it doesn't have to be directly related to like what you're selling. But if you can exactly. get people in the door, they will reciprocate that back because you provided them so much value. Like there's a, a saying from Alex Hormozzi that I really like. And he talks about how if the stuff that I give away for free is better than what other people are selling, my customers are imagining in their head, oh my God, how good is his stuff that he sells? Like, right. if you can take that concept and you can put that out there, like if you're talking about a, a fishing guide and they provide for free tips and tricks and techniques on how to fish this certain river, that certain river, or like provide you when the fish are biting, where the fish are biting, and you give that away for free, you're like, oh my God, this guy knows so much. Like, they're probably gonna go out and try it, not catch a bunch, and then they're gonna be like, I think I'm gonna call that guy because he seems to know what he's doing. And he's provided a right. lot of value to me. So, and you gotta collect I, I like info that. too. Like, uh, yeah. you, you get people in the door, and then if they leave immediately, then you have no way to contact them or offer them anything. So, you know, it's a, a big part of getting people in the door is also knowing how to retain them. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's pop-ups and if they give their information, you know, for some sort of guide, you know, add more value. So like you write an article on your own thing. Okay. Here's a, uh, a free email series of three consecutive emails that teach you how to your in more detail. And then you can then recycle more content pump more series into the emails you can start selling flies in those emails or your services. You can go, Hey, you want to go out on the water and go euro nymphing. I'll supply all the euro nymphing equipment. Now you have a, you know, you work them up the value ladder. You start them free value, like just like a, uh, here's an article, here's a PDF that costs $9 or whatever. And then here's a fishing trip guided trip. And then you just work them way up and then, you gain their loyalty throughout because you're providing immense value and you know, they'll give it right back. That's basically the yeah. whole formula. 
So you're talking about lead magnets in that situation, right? In, in that, yeah. In order to get them to, in order to earn their information, like email, yeah. phone number, however you, you collect it. Yeah, offer them something for free. Offer them something for free as a lead magnet, and then you're able to sell them things down the road. Okay. Yeah, and if you're an expert in that area, it should be really easy to just pump yeah. out something, even if it's a, yeah. a couple paragraphs. Yeah, so like for you, it'd be very easy to say, you know, here's how you make this fly. Or exactly. <laughs> here are the top flies to use in this area that you know. And everyone can, everyone can think of that, like what their top area of expertise is. And something very simple can be turned into a lead magnet. Um, here's my question, because this is kind of taken the uh, direction of marketing, which I like, because that's something... Um, that's something that a lot of our clients like overcomplicate, I would say. Everyone's like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, we're not bringing in as many trips. It's because we don't have great marketing. A lot of times they're just not doing the simple things, in my opinion. If you were to come in to a business like yours, someone else who has, you know, a blog and is trying to sell flies or sell some type of product in the outdoor industry and you had to revamp their customer acquisition in six months, what do you do? What's the first thing you look at and what's your strategy? Yeah, so I mean, there's regional and then there's online acquisition. So like everyone in the country and then what's in your area. So I try, like the easiest thing to do is to immediately go to like rafting companies, uh, people who sell flies or at least uh, touch that audience and I'll just go hey here's some like get some business cards off of Vista print with like coupons or some sort of referral method where you just go hey if you get people it will, we'll share customers you get people in for rafting see if any of them want to go fly fishing bam people in the door um, you know just try anywhere your customers could be locally be in that area start doing talking about events. like for a guide service you're talking about right now? Yeah, yeah. How you'd grow yeah, a guide so, service? Okay, yep. Oh yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, I, I, I realize you asked about my company. Yeah, so. No, let's, no, let's I, go down I that rabbit hole. Thing. No, let's okay. go down that rabbit hole. If you had to come in and you had to grow a guide service in six months, what are the first things that you do? Yeah, I, I mean, there's people who already have audiences. I would just start making a list of people that you know that are in the fly fishing industry and just go, Hey, can you share your audience? What is it going to cost? What, what do you want from me? Can I come to your fly shop and, or to your event or something and just give a presentation, start, start getting people that way. It's going to take more sweat equity because if you don't have money to spend on like Facebook ads and stuff like that, which probably wouldn't be that effect, effective for you, you want to go to people who already have the audiences. So like, local blogs people like in pennsylvania here there's pa fly fish form like that thing is massive there's tens of thousands of members i would get on there contact the administrator and just go hey can i put an ad on your website i'll give you 30 percent of all of my revenue from people who book my trips now there that that gets you that you just bought an audience with no money down because you're going to share your future earnings uh go just like uh, social media accounts, see if you can get on, on their radar, see if you can offer some sort of guest post, guest post on blogs. Um, you know, I would do all of this stuff and it's, and you're basically just giving free content because one of the hardest things is to maintain that consistency and people are willing to trade information or their audience in exchange for engaging and keeping their audience entertained, you know, so uh, email lists. Like I would just, anyone, you know, with an audience, get on that radar, see how you can work your way in and then start acquiring customers through that list. Um, you could start doing regional and local events. Like that's a big one. There's always TU, you know, programs, project healing waters, nonprofits, stuff like that. You know, everyone there, there, there's, there's something there always. So, you know, just dig deep and, and bootstrap it, meaning, you know, try to spend as little money as possible because likely you don't have much and you don't want to spend that much. And then just try to go to free 
go through all the free you know methods and then at the same time document everything and film everything and get on TikTok, get on Instagram, get on YouTube, get on Facebook and just post the same video on all of them. So tailor it for TikTok because that's where you're going to get most of the views and tailor it for Instagram Reels which is just, you know, like a vertical portrait style. You know, you hold your phone like this and you film what you're doing or have someone film you doing something and then just keep documenting and you know, just keep promoting it. Like you post it on TikTok, you post it on Instagram Reels, you post it on Facebook, and then you go to YouTube and you post it on there. It takes 30 minutes to do all of it. It's not hard. And it's just like, just getting in the habit of filming. And then, you know, I, I get like, you would have a full roster within six months. You know, mm -hmm. like if you just do that, I, I, I bet you it would work <clears throat> tremendously well. Cause I do, I, that's what we're doing right now. And it's working great for us. So I, uh, uh, I would do that. I think that there's a common misconception about when you're starting a business and you're looking to acquire customers. People think you have to create those customers. You don't create customers. You just have to find them. Like they already exist. Yeah. So what you're saying is go to the people who already have those existing customers, provide them some type of value so that they're willing to give you those customers in return. Like yeah. if I was a... Your most of your blogs, your blogs go all over the country, right? Or are they yeah. focused more towards Pennsylvania? All over. Okay. So if I were starting a guide service in Colorado, let's say, and I wanted to grow my business, I would go to people like you who have blogs and I would say, can I write you a blog on how to fish this specific section of the river and what I do this time of year so that you don't have to write it. <laughs> you get some value out of it. You have something entertaining for your customers. And can you please link to my website? Yep. And here's a 10% or 20% offer that anyone who comes from your website can, can use to exactly. get a free trip. So provide value to other people who have the audiences and then you can capitalize on it later. This actually brings me to something that I've been workshopping in my head lately on SEO. One of the reasons I think that GoGuide has been successful with boosting our SEO really quickly um, is that when we built our system, the way that our guides access their calendars and log in, they go to our website. Mm -hmm. That's how they log in. So every day we get a lot of website views just because the way we built our system, we have a bunch of people who are going to it and yeah. it's helped Google to be like, oh yeah, these guys get a lot of people going to it. Yeah, they're trustworthy. And exactly. I, I totally understand that there is like SEO optimization that you can do for your website, like making sure that you have your photos meta tagged, that you have keywords in the right locations, it's optimized for different searches. But I see a lot of companies who spend a lot of money on people who are doing SEO. What is your take on how you actually grow SEO? Because I am, and this is just my theory, my theory is that you can build your SEO by just being smart as a business and making strategic right plays like reaching out to people like you to write a blog for them. Yeah. So backlinking your website. Yeah. Backing backlinking is super like, that's like a cornerstone right there. I mean like the two things I'm, I'm not that much of an expert, but I've sat around people who are, and they talk about like a H refs. Well, I probably said that wrong. A H refs. Yeah, no, that's right. And like surfer SEO and all this stuff. And I've just learned so much from these people and all of them basically say the same thing. You need to have content and you need to have backlinks. So over time, backlinks accumulate. And that's essentially when your website links to another person's website and vice versa. So like in, in, you know, in our case here, I'm linking people to go guides to go book trips and to help those, you know, outfitters get, get people on their calendars. And then in, and so like in that specific scenario, go guides 
is getting a boost in SEO ranking because my website has been around longer, eight years, and I have a ton of content that people already back to backlink and a lot of visitors. So in that case, GoGuides gets a boost because Google goes, okay, they're worth trusting. They have authority now because this other person of authority linked to them. So backlinking is incredibly important. So like if you come out with an article, uh, it would be advantageous of you to go to other people and go, hey, could you link my article in your articles? Like here's your, your article is talking about how to tr catch gigantic brown trout in Wisconsin or something. I don't know. And then my article talks about how to fly fish streamers and the, like everything you need to know. So in your article about talking about brown trout, you mentioned streamers here, 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 here. Can you link in one of those to my article? And then that's a backlink. And if, if it adds value to them, then they'll probably do it. And, you know, it's like a hit or miss. Some people don't want to, some people want money. Some people want more in exchange. You know, it's sort of like a, a sharing, you know, give and take sort of thing. Um, but backlink and have tons of content because the deeper your site is on Google, the, the, the more authority and the higher point scale you're going to have. So like some people, some people write tons of articles and some people just have a massive amount of pages, sort of the same thing, but slightly different. So pages can be built in, in multiple ways, like categories, uh, individual product pages. So like, for example, the fly crate, I have articles, I have category pages like blue winged fly, blue winged olive flies. And then deeper than that, I have the blue winged olive done fly. And then, uh, in your case, you have a mass amount of pages and you also have articles and stuff like that. But the majority of your site I'm assuming is just like, here are trips in Colorado. Here's an outfitter in Colorado. Here are all their different, uh, you know, here are all their different trips that they offer right there. You just, you just like exponentially, it's just like getting deeper and deeper. It's like a big spider web of you just having more width and depth. And that, that's essentially what, what you want to add on your website. Because if it's like you have a three page website, Google is going to look at it and go, okay, it doesn't have much authority. Not many people are going to it. Why should it rank first for a major keyword? that all these people search every single day, like how to fly fish for trout. Why should your article or your page show up first? And if it doesn't have, if it doesn't have the merits, then it's not going to show like you'll be page 20 deep and no one's going to see your website. So, you know, you have to, and it's also like keywords, you got to write your articles and your pages mm -hmm. and you got to do them well enough to which Google recognizes and flags those keywords and go, Oh, they talk about fly fishing for trout and they literally say that in the article, Google will go, Oh, we rec we see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to rank for that keyword. And if you don't have that keyword, you know, then you're not going to rank for it. Like I'm not, I'm not ranking for fly fishing in Africa because I don't have any articles for fly fishing in Africa. Like there's no content at all. So when someone searches that on my website or on Google, I am not going to come up. But that is something mm -hmm. that we could do just by adding in keywords, writing an article about it. Bam. Now that's how you do it. And I have a little bit of a, an advantage over smaller companies and, and just individuals, because when you have a massive website of just so much content and you get visitors and Google trusts you, any, vi any article that you post or page that you create automatically boosts you above other people because of the merit score that you have. So over time you accumulate more and it eventually becomes easier and easier. But you know, it took me eight years to get here. Uh, con content marketing and SEO is a long-term strategy, which is why I didn't mention it in like uh, if I had six months to turn around a business, it, it would be like a long-term play that I would focus on after six months. Like I'd do it immediately, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. see any results until like a year from now. Yeah. That's a big thing that I, I think it needs to be understood by people is like, if you're paying someone to come in and do SEO for you, you're not going to see results for a while. Yeah. And in my opinion, you could just put a little thing on your calendar. That's like once every two weeks, I'm going to write a blog 
and right. I'm going to just get started and then I'm going to reach out to other people and see if I can write an article for them or like I have this video that does a really good job explaining this technique who would get some value from that who would maybe share it and maybe attach it to their their blog I would just focus on documenting value and like doing the little hard things to build it up over time um, and I would get creative with some of the other ways like I liked what you said about going and finding <clears throat> local companies who probably have your customer base and see if you can do some type of partnership. Like I've always thought with, if you're a, uh, a guide service that doesn't have a lodging piece of your business, like go find the, all the VRBOs in your area Yeah, and see if you can leave a card like that they could have on the table for people and say like anyone who comes from this link you know will give you an affiliate commission or something like I, i've never tried that but i've always thought that that'd be a great way to, to do it like people who go stay in these locations they want you know they want to be able to provide their guests with something to do and yeah it could be one of those things to go do so like just get creative um but oh, it's super yeah. interesting to hear like how you built your business online um and you you timed it really well too, and it you were able to start it with a, a differentiated piece of the subscription box, um, and that allowed you to kind of enter the market with something unique, and then you focused on providing value to people, um, and people respect that, and they are willing to vote with their dollars on whether or not you exactly. provided them enough value. Yeah. So i don't think that you know marketing as a whole needs to be as complicated as we make it out to be i think you should just look to provide value to people who are your customers but there's actually there's a piece before that um before you provide value is trying to understand your customers and look at right. what are their dream outcomes like that's a big thing that i do and i think through a lot is if i know i want to provide value to people to get long-term customers, I need to understand what their dream outcome is so that I can speak directly to that. Then you can provide value that hits on their ability to achieve that dream outcome. And then you have to do the stuff on the back end, which also is a spot where not a lot of people do this very well is the follow up to turn those initial customers or leads into repeat business down the road. Like you had said, you just need to keep reminding people that you're alive and yeah, that exactly. your company exists. So when you talk about a guide service, it's like, great, you just actually converted this lead into someone who just went on a trip with you. Make sure that you do some things that are going to get them to know you're there and potentially come back. Like, honestly, like do the little simple things. Like if you're a small guide service, write a thank you card. Yeah. Right? Like that little small gesture is going to go so far. And unless you are running a thousand trips, and even if you're running a thousand trips, you have time to write a thank you card to your client and they right. will appreciate that. Christmas, great. Send them a Christmas card. Like it's the little things. It's doing the little things that other companies don't do that can set you apart. And yeah, that's what I think you can really succeed in the long term with and and I, I, like going off of that too like if if i were starting a guiding service and let's say i got a customer in the door like we did all this work we got one person in they bought they we had a great time i got all this footage so on and so forth i would ask them to write down like five names if they feel comfortable be like give me five names and numbers of people that you think would enjoy what i have to offer and then just sit down, email or call those people and then go, hey, look, we're, my services are usually $500 for this trip. I'm willing to do it for $250. Like give them a, a really good deal, an offer that they can't refuse. Like it's like it's so good they would feel stupid turning it down. And then just, just work, that, no. yeah. work, work that referral yeah. program. Like just, just start. Like once you get one in the door, now, now you got some traction and start working his friends, his family, or the, you know, their fa friends and family, and then just slowly just crawl your way through everyone possible. And you know, 
like leave no rock unturned like just just yeah there's a there's a strategy again by alex hormozzi or a framework by him that i heard the other day that i really liked and it was if you could never do any marketing again and the next customer that you acquire is the only new customer you could get and the entire remainder of your business had to come from the referral of that customer, what would you do? Yeah. Which is a super interesting thought exercise to make you figure out what would I do to get that person to refer more trips to me. Yeah. Um, and I really like that. And get Another them on thing, Google, write a review, yeah. five stars, uh, images, yeah. photos, videos, get, get, their, get their stamp of approval and then just roll with that. Another thing that I think is not done enough, that's a really simple thing that you could do is, and it solves the problem of not having content for social media. If you just provided an awesome trip to someone, ask them if you can f get a video testimonial. Like, yeah. hey, well, can I, would you really quick like film a video testimonial for me? And then that can be your social proof that you post on your social media and then see if they would joint post it. <laughs> like they might, it doesn't hurt to ask, but yeah. that's really good content that builds your credibility. It actually makes you collect testimonials because most people are like, you'd be surprised how many times I've built a website and I ask for testimonials and they're like, uh, let me reach out to a couple of people and see if I can get them. Like you got to have those. Those are really important. Um, but if you do a video testimony, you solve like, bunch of problems all at once like you get credibility <laughs> yeah. you get social media posts like you might get some referrals because they might joint post it or share it um and you have a database of testimonials so it's like little things like that and honestly that's that's why i was intrigued with kind of like starting doing this podcast was i've been learning a lot of these things over the course of like working with outfitters and just starting my own business too like i'm trying to figure a lot of this stuff out for me as much as I am like for our clients too. Right. And this is a good mechanism for me to go be a reporter and hear stuff from people like you who've been successful, take it all in, pull the bits and pieces of it that I think might be useful for other people. And then like create that playbook of value that I can offer to our guides. Like all the stuff that I'm, I've kind of talked about in this episode of, providing value like that is actually what this the reason for this podcast is so like we're doing it um but it also helps me kind of work through the ideas that i'm working on on my right. own and i know this about myself that i am someone who needs to talk ideas out <laughs> to be able to like fully comprehend them i yeah. can't just like sit in bed and ponder Same. it for three months i have <laughs> to like i have to discuss it with people to like really flesh out the idea but I think this is super, super valuable. And like the reason I knew you'd be a good person to bring on, Thank even you. though like a <laughs> lot of our guides, like it's a different business, right? But it's the business of the outdoors, right? You can learn from every business and you can apply it to your business. And that's what you should do. The reason I knew you would be good is because a lot of our customers struggle with the online piece of it. Right. And like, okay that's how you built your business is by being able to be an expert in how you scale the online side. And what I can say is that there is a way for you to scale your guide service. If you're selling $500 trips, because this guy was able to scale his website selling $3 flies. Like, yeah, you can make it happen. Yeah. So it was super cool to, to learn from you and hear that. Um, I have a idea for a closing tradition that I want to start on this podcast and I haven't done it yet. So you'll be the first. Um, I want to ask at the end of every podcast, what is your favorite experience or trip that you've had in the outdoors and what is your bucket list? Oh trip? yeah. It is a good one. And I want to hear what people's answers are. So like, I don't have any amazing, like I didn't go fishing in uh, the Amazon or something like that, but it was it was more of like a testimony to my hard work in in college. So I I built the fly crate out of my college dorm room. Like I it was in a closet, 
and then it slowly grew into the 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 walk-in closet and then it grew into like a full-fledged business and the when i when i finally earned enough money i went and i uh i bought a fly rod and then i went fly fishing on a drift boat with Brian uh Snyder who developed some of the flies that we sell and he's uh he's actually a guide on your on your website but i never went on a guided trip before and i never went bass fishing on a boat or trout fishing it was my first time on fly fishing off of a boat drift boat and we went down the uh little junietta river in central pennsylvania and caught some smallmouth bass and it was amazing i we a lot of the photos we took we still use today and probably the coolest experience was to know like I personally my business that I started from nothing paid for this trip not only is it a tax write off but I was able to use the content and I had so much fun but the guy that I sold his flies basically paid self paid for the trip that I paid to him so like all the flies that he makes I sold and then gave him the money to go on the trip it was just super gratifying rewarding um never got to do anything like that like before I was pinching pennies and now I'm on a drift boat fly and I'm going to do another trip here shortly so you know it all it just compounds and it grows and I want to work that up to where the point I can do a saltwater flat trip and get some get like the trifecta you know the what do they call it the it's like the three uh, the home run that's what it's called mm-hmm. uh I want to get a permit a tarpon and a bonefish and i want to do that all in like the bahamas or what like one of those islands or something like that and i want it, the business to pay for it all but that's like dream trip when i hit that i know i made it because they're super expensive and it's a lot of money and i've just been working towards that i i could do it right now but it would hurt and i would just be like that was money <laughs> i was going to use for something else so uh i i really want to do that and you know i'm 26 now so by 30 I should have that under my belt and should be a lot of fun but that's that's goals and you know started started in Pennsylvania so I'm I'm excited to do that that's that's awesome I I love it I mean your nice story is very similar like I would love to say that I had this grand vision for go guide but you know as a 21 year old it was a lot of how can I make money in the outdoors and how yeah. can I go on hunting and fishing trips and have that be a tax write off and then yeah. go guide was born and i'd love to say it was something much more grand um than that <laughs> but basically the concept was figure out how i can make money in the outdoors figure out how i can go on those trips and i've kind of was like the best way to do that is probably to help other people be able to do that and that's what we do and hopefully there's a few more trips in both of our uh futures especially now that yeah. we're working together um and i appreciate you being being willing to help us hopefully we can help you and we can connect people to some pretty awesome experiences together um in partnership so nate thank you very much for doing this this was a a pleasure yeah thank you so much carter i i really do appreciate it i i had a great time me too always fun to to talk outdoors and business that's that's why we started this it's fun for me <laughs>